Hello, everybody. Uh, I will stand back to be not too close to the cameras. Uh, so, hi. Uh, it's nice to see so many people. Here. This is a pretty large group. So, welcome uh, anybody who's new and anybody who's old. Uh, I will quickly go through some announcements and then we will move right on to Aiden's Haskell presentation. Uh, so, quick things about the space. Uh, we will run, uh, we'll, uh, Aiden will go for about an hour ish. We'll stop around 8 o'clock, take a 10 minute break. Uh, bathrooms are in the back, water is off the side if you need it, um, and then we'll continue on for about as long as Aiden is willing to talk and tell us things and answer questions. Uh, the, let's see, what we have coming up uh, after this, uh, we've got Saltstack and uh, Stephanie Rosiak, I'm probably saying her name wrong, uh, from High WR, are coming up next month. Nathan Fish is going to be presenting on Saltstack. We have Theo Blair is presenting Rust in June. We have Free Switch by Bob in July. Someone's excited for that. It certainly isn't Bob. <laughs> oh, and I'm blanking on the last. Oh, um, and Scott King is going to be presenting on the Brave browser. Um, but he's planning to do a short presentation, so we're looking for probably two other, like, 20 ish minute quick things. Um, if you have something you want to do that's like browser related, that would fit well. Uh, Brave is a browser that blocks ads primarily, uh, and also has a revenue sharing model for the ads that it blocks. So if you wanted to talk about like um, other ad blocking things or other ways to like pay people for things you like on the internet that are free software related. I'd like to, yeah. Oh, all right. That is one of the few times that my request for presentations up here <laughs> actually work. So. I, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe. I will talk. All right. <laughs> I, I look forward to convincing you later. <laughs> All right, uh, so there were two things I saw. Uh, Debian conference is coming up in Montreal in August. Does anybody else know any other things that are happening here or Toronto or the Montreal area? No? Okay. Anybody have anything else they want to announce? Companies hiring? No? All right, then I will not delay you any further. David is going to tell us all about the wonderful world of Haskell and functional programming. Thank you very much, Eden. For coming out. So, yeah, my talk is uh, it's an introduction to functional programming and uh, Haskell. And this is the Haskell, Haskell logo. So, what is functional programming? Well, I'm going to do a lot of, uh, often I'm going to be comparing functional programming against uh, imperative programming. Am I talking? Loud enough? Like, is this too loud or not loud enough? It's good? Okay. Um, I'm going to be comparing functional programming to imperative programming. Imperative programming is probably what most of you are familiar with, with C or Java or Python. Um, but functional programming is a bit different in that uh, it treats functions as first class items in the, in, the, in the programming language. In imperative programming languages, you usually aren't able to pass functions into functions or return functions from functions. And so that limits how you're, how how small you're able to break the pieces down into. You have you know functions and you pass data into them, do things with the data, like you pass a class in or an integer or something like that, and then manipulate it and then usually return something from it. Or sometimes you don't have to return something from it. But functional programming makes heavy use of, of manipulating functions. And they also use expressions, which uh, it says no assignment here. So there usually aren't assignment operations like i equals one, and then in a for loop, for example, you might increment i or something like that. Um, expressions are sort of akin to like a mathematical expression where you evaluate a bunch of stuff and you return something from it. Usually in functional programming, every, every line you, you evaluate returns something. And it says ideally you have no side effects. Different languages um, have different strictness about this. Side effects means that your function does something that is outside of the function. So reading in from the console, or printing out to the console, or reading a file, that's, that's a side effect. Also, a side effect would be if you have a variable that you're passing in, manipulating that variable in such a way that something outside of your function is able to see it. That would be a side effect as well. Um, and functional programming is a different way of, of solving problems. 
And so here's a brief history. Um, in the 1930s, a uh, type of mathematics called the Lambda Calculus was invented to help people reason and think about what you can do with mathematical functions. And it wasn't until several, several years later that Lisp was uh, first, first created. It was created as a sort of computerized solver of Lambda Calculus expressions. And after that came ML. These are colored differently. The green ones are the ones that are kind of in the, in the Lisp family tree, and the red ones are the ones that are in the ML family tree. Um, ML approaches problems differently than, than Lisp, but it's still sort of founded in Lambda Calculus. Um, one of the big differences is that Lisp and its sort of uh, family members are, are dynamic languages and untyped, whereas ML and its family are, are, are static and, and, and typed. And so then there's Scheme, and there's Erlang. Erlang is white because it's not, doesn't really fall into either one of the camps. It's, it's quite different, but it's a, it's a great function language as well. And there's Haskell, and OCaml, Scala, and F-sharp, and in 2007 there's, there's, there's Clojure. So who uses functional, functional programming? Um, initially, a lot of people in academia use it. It's, it's sort of a high-level abstract approach to, to uh, solving problems. And you can do a lot of abstract things with it. Um, and so it appeals to people in academia who like to make proof-solving proof um, programs or things that, that prove certain things. Um, also, language researchers are interested in it. Uh, Haskell is actually a Microsoft, Microsoft Language Research Labs project. Um, and there's a growing interest, though, in functional programming because it allows you to solve uh, some interesting problems that are coming up with um, multi-core systems. Uh, multi-core programming, multi-threaded things, and concurrent things is, is challenging because you have a lot of different things that are interacting with each other, and some of the the features of functional programming, mainly its limiting side effects and uh, what's called functional purity, which we'll get into uh, shortly, those things are very helpful for doing, for doing concurrent programming. And some of the best concurrent languages uh, in the world are Haskell and Clojure, which are, uh, which we're talking about. Okay, so why, why use functional programming? Safety uh, is one of the, the, the big ones. Um, Functional programming is usually safer than imperative programming because you're not able to make a lot of the same kind of mistakes. Uh, there, there are certain kinds of mistakes that are very common in imperative programming that you simply can't make in functional programming because you can't do it. Um, programs can be very modular. The way that programs are broken down can be broken down even smaller, into, into smaller chunks, more modular chunks than, um, than classes or, or um, individual sort of functions in. In, in structured programming. Uh, concurrency is another big, big reason to use functional programming because they're really good at doing highly concurrent uh, programs. Uh, they're very concise, meaning that the programs are rather sort of dense to read. There's lots of information packed into a few lines of code. It's fun, it's a different way of, of uh, programming. I enjoy, I enjoy it, it's challenging, and it's better. But there's a start there because it's better at solving certain types of problems Whereas imperative programming is definitely better at solving other types of problems. So uh, I don't think functional programming will ever eclipse imperative or the other way around because they both are, have their strengths. Okay, so let's get into some of these, these sort of structures of functional programming. This is, I guess, sort of the, the bread and butter of what usually makes up functional programs. Uh, lists are one of the sort of big founding, big founding types of, of uh, structures. Here this represents the the empty list, and you can have different items in your list. Uh, the notation that I'm going to be using in this talk is, is Haskell notation, which will look maybe a little bit different uh, than what you're used to, but uh, it'll come in handy later when the talk switches over to you Haskell. So here we see a list. It's got three items in it. They're integers. And there's this little colon operator here, which is called cons. And what it lets you do is it lets you uh, prepend an item onto a list. And so to build up the list of one, two, three, we just prepend one onto a list here. This list is two prepended onto three, which is prepended onto the, the, uh, the null list. And so this lets you build up by prepending things, build up a list. And we can do the same thing with characters here. So this is a list of characters. So concatenation, it's a very common operation. Um, indexing, you don't do indexing too much. 
um, because uh, these lists are singly linked lists, which means to get to the nth uh, item in the list, you have to traverse the entire list to get to that item because you follow the links all the way to it. So indexing and using lists in functional programming is not very efficient. There are arrays, like constant time indexing arrays uh, in functional programming, but um, those are more sort of specialized items, I guess. Uh, taking the head and the tail of the list is very common. So here's, here's the, the head function applied to the list one, two, three. Well, that's the first thing in the list, that's one. Here's the tail function applied to the same list. It returns the tail, which is everything but the head, so that's, that's two, three. And here we see Haskell notation. In Haskell, when you have a function here, you don't have to put brackets around it. The, the functions sort of take things that are to the right end and evaluate them. Okay, uh, another structure is tuples. Tuples are more for bundling data together. You can't concatenate tuples and you can't take the head or tail of them. Um, they're just for bundling data up. In a type language like, like Haskell, each, each tuple has its own type depending on what you put in it. So this would be integer, integer string. This would be string, a list of integers. But in, in untyped languages, your lists can have mixed data types as well, but not another Haskell. And lists in Haskell have to be all the same, same type. <clears throat> so other techniques, um, programming techniques, there's only recursion. There are no for loops or while loops or do loops. It's just recursion. And so here is a canonical example, the Fibonacci sequence. Um, this is how you define the Fibonacci sequence in, in, in Haskell. You have the first line that says the Fibonacci applied to one is, is one, Fibonacci applied to two is, is one, and then Fibonacci applied to n, well that is Fibonacci applied to n minus one plus Fibonacci applied to n minus two. And this is a, this is a recursive definition of the Fibonacci function, which is, is that's an order to the end, which is really, really terrible order. You can write this in a different way that's linear time order. But this is sort of how you do it. So other common techniques, there's the map function. The map allows you to take a function and apply it to every item in the list. So it transforms everything in the list according to this function f. So we see f applied to a, f applied to b, and so on. Another technique is filter, and filter allows you to eliminate things from the list based on a predicate function. So here's filter, this is a predicate function which is less than five. And so it takes, um, it takes an item and then runs a test on it, and if the test is true, it stays in the list. If the test is false, it gets kicked out of the list. So here less than five, we see that one passes, five does not pass, not, neither does not, but three and four do pass. So this allows you to transform lists by removing items from it. And another technique is folding. Folding allows you to take a list and sort of evaluate it down into a single value. So here we see fold takes the plus operation and an uh, a initial accumulator. The accumulator is a thing that sort of gets built up as you go through the list. And so here's a list. We start out with zero and we add one to that. And we add five to that answer and we keep going until we end up with, with, with 22. So these are kind of trivial, just simple arithmetic examples. But when you start applying these techniques to more complicated data structures, um, uh, functional programming becomes even more powerful. And so another language feature, first class functions, I mentioned we're able to pass functionality into other functions. So say we have two functions here, f1 and f2. Uh, we, we define f1 when it's applied to x is just two times x. f2 is four times x. But f3 is different. It allows us to take a variable, but also a function f here. And when we evaluate it, well, it takes our, var our variable v, applies that to f, and then adds three times variable v applied to f to give us the answer. And so we can pass in here, we, we evaluate f3 with a variable equal to five, then we just pass in this whole f1 function. And what does that do? Well, f here becomes f1, which is two times x, so it's two times five, plus three times two times five, that's, that's 40. And if we put in f2 instead, then the function that we're evaluating changes, and that gives us a different number. And so another really cool language feature that uh, most functional programming languages have is something called pattern matching, uh, which has no analog in imperative programming. I first encountered uh, pattern matching when I learned Erlang, and it's, it's really cool because it allows you to um, assign many variables 
you know, one's just using the structure of the sort of data that you're binding it onto. So here we can use it for variable assignment. We have a cons b. This is just, excuse me. This is this list generating operator. I'm sorry. So we have we have the cons operator here, which takes the head and the tail. And when we have this on the left side, the program language automatically knows to bind the items up here onto these variables based on the structure of the left-hand side. So the head gets bound to A, uh, gets bound to A, and then the tail gets bound to B like this. So that's another way that you're able to write concise programs because instead of having two separate lines where you'd say A is equal to the head of the list, B is equal to the tail of the list, you just write one thing and it automatically assigns it all. So here's an example with a tuple. So we have this tuple here is equal to this tuple here, and it automatically unpacks and assigns all the variables like this. So you can also use pattern matching to define functions. And so in Haskell to define a funny function here, that when you pass zero into it, it gives you one. You pass two into it, it gives you five. And when you pass anything else into it, it just adds nine onto whatever you, you uh, pass in. So in an imperative language, you might define your function here as taking in a variable that does a, a switch statement or some, some, some if statements and checks to see what the value is and then alters its behavior like this. But in Haskell, you just define it multiple times. And now you can combine it together. So let's combine variable assignment and function definition together. So we have function, some function f applied to tuple a, b. That's just equal to a, a plus b. So when we pass in 1, 2, it gives us 3. We can also define this function called map, which we've seen. But here's how you actually define it. You have map, some function f applied to the empty list. Well, there's nothing there, so it's just the empty list. And if you apply a uh, function map um, with some function f onto a list that has a head and a tail, the tail could be the empty list, but the head is at least one thing. Well, that's equal to f applied to your head, and then that's cons onto map recursively applied to the rest of the list, the tail of the list. So if your list has several items in it, it just keeps building up this way more and more and more until it finally gets to the end, and it matches this case here, and that sticks the empty, the, the null list on the end, and you get, you get the, the transform list. Okay, another common feature of functional programming languages are lambda functions, which some imperative programming languages like uh, Python and Java version 8, I think, have, and I think C-sharp, maybe some other languages. But these, the lambda functions are kind of trickling into other languages as well because they're, they're handy. So here we've seen this function definition already. f applied to the tuple a, b, that's equal to a plus b. You apply it here, it gives us 5. But instead of defining a function here separately and then applying it, we could define a sort of anonymous function in line that just gets used in this one place. So in Haskell, that's with a uh, slash. And so we say slash, and then we have the list of variables. Well, it just has one, one variable here. This is a tuple containing a and b. And that's just equal to a plus b. Then we apply that to 2 comma 3. That gives us 5. Let's try using this on a map. Well, we have map, and our function here is the same thing. It's this lambda function. It takes in a tuple and adds the two items together. Then we apply that to this list here. And that transforms every item in the list here. And so we're seeing first class functions being used here, where we're taking a lambda function, we're passing it into another function map, and we're using that to alter the items in the list. Another language feature that not all functional languages have, but Haskell makes heavy use of, is something called curry, where you apply a function to less than the full number of arguments that it's expecting, and it gives you another function that is expecting the rest of the arguments. So let's say we have a function that takes two arguments. f takes a and b, and then adds them together. Let's let define a new function g to be equal to f applied to 2. We're not using supplying b yet, so it generates a function that's expecting one more thing. So it's like 2 plus and then something else. So if we apply 3 to g, then that takes or f, f2, and then apply to 3, so it's 2 plus something else, and then something else is 3, which gives us 5. And um, even if your language doesn't have, have currying functionality in it, if you have lambda functions, you can very easily 
define your query as well, just by having a lambda function that takes an argument and applies to the function that has some of the items specified already. Um, another thing is function composition. Um, not all languages have this, Erlang doesn't have it, but again, if you have random functions, you can emulate this. Curve composition allows you to take two functions and fuse them together to create a new function. And so the way that you define it, one of the neat things about Haskell is that you can define functions implicitly instead of saying, here's a function that takes these arguments. You can sort of use it in line how you would naturally use it, and Haskell figures out what you mean. So f dot g, this dot is composition, applied to x, well that's just equal to f applied to g applied to x. And so these brackets here, this, this is just to indicate that g is the value of x first, and then the value from this is passed into f. So what it allows you to do it is you take the value of variable x, evaluate it with g, and then pass it on to f. So you can string a whole bunch of things together using composition and take a variable and sort of thread it through all the functions you want as the functions transform it and pass them on to each other. So here, let's do an example where we combine currying and composition at the same time. So here, define a function x of 2 times x, define g, that's 3 times x plus y, and we define h. So here we partially apply g. We apply the supply just a 3, but it's missing one extra thing. Well, then we apply that to f. f is expecting only one thing. So what we end up with is a function that's expecting one thing, and that gets passed into g partially applied to 3, and then that gets passed into f. So let's try applying 4 to h here. So we evaluate this first, g, apply this 3, and then 4. And that gives us this here, and then we pass it into to f, which is 2 times, so that gives us 26 at the end. Again, these are simple arithmetic examples, but as you um, and, and encounter more, more complicated um, problems, you're able to use these in interesting ways. You can take little, little function bits, even things from your libraries that have certain property or do a certain job, and fuse them together into a sort of function that does what you want. It's kind of similar to Unix pipes. You probably all know how super useful Unix piping is. You take a bunch of small, really helpful little commands and pass stuff through them to get some transformed result at the end. That's pretty much exactly what function composition is. So let's try a combined example. Now, it has some small some small text here. So if it's too small, then I'm just going to gloss over all the, all the details because you probably won't be able to see it. So let's, let's try making some... Oh, okay, let's try to make something that uses everything that we've discussed so far. Lists, tuples, map, filter, fold, all this other stuff. So this is a problem that I actually had to solve at work. Um, I had uh, a file. This is just split into two columns, so it doesn't run off the end of the screen. But this is one, one big file with uh, some headers. The headers are different. They're stuff one and stuff two. But they're all denoted by this little arrow thing here. And then there's numbers after it. What I want to do is I want to go through this file and pull out all the parts where stuff one appears, and then add these numbers together. So what I should end up with in the end is some of these numbers, some of these numbers, and some of these numbers in the list with three items in it, and ignoring all the other ones. So, how well can people see that? Not very well. Okay. Well, okay, I don't know how useful this is going to be then. Um, I'll just sort of gloss over it then. Um, so what we want is a function that takes this, this list and splits it up according to these prefixes. So whenever it encounters a, uh, a uh, prefix here, it will kind of, it will kind of chunk, the, chunk these things together like this. And so, um, yeah, I won't even talk about this because you can't, if you can't see it, then there's no point. Um, but it, may, it, it makes use of, um, yeah, too bad. I'm just going to kind of skip over this because it, 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 yeah. it kind of a general walkthrough of like the, the large moving parts of what it's doing? Does that, would that make any sense? If we can't, uh, yeah, the yeah, okay. So I'll just kind of e explain what it's doing without seeing all the, the fine details. So what this does is because there's, there's, there's no looping, we have a 
function in here, it's, it's, a, it's a helper function, and it calls itself. And so what it does is it takes this big long thing, which when you pass it in, it's, it's a list of strings, one string for, for each line. And what it does is it builds up an accumulator, kind of like what the, uh, the fold function does. And as it builds up this accumulator, it detects when it encounters one of these headers. And when it encounters one of these headers, it takes the old accumulator and sticks that onto like the total accumulator of what's going to be returned. And then so it starts on again with a smaller accumulator, builds this up, and when it detects that it's encountered one of these again, then it pops this on to the total accumulator. It keeps going until we finally accumulate a list of lists of strings. So each one of these lines is a string. And each one of these is a list of strings, a, a list of strings. And this whole thing together is a list of lists of strings. And so that's what it does. And so we've seen, or should, would have seen, this pattern matching and recursion. And if you want to try seeing some of the other things, then we can define this function here called, called uh, process. And what it does, um, I, I define this in two different ways, because this doesn't make use of composition, which we'll see next. But here we just have a bunch of different lines, and it applies a simple, simple sort of function on each line and binds it to sensible sounding variables. And what it does, the first thing, it, it takes this big long string, which is the entire contents of the file. And you read in the file, and it has to, it's just one big long string. You use a function called lines on it, and what that does is it detects new line characters and then splits it into a list of strings. And then, so that's what it does here. And then it applies our little function here called segment by, segment by uh, prefix to break it up into little chunks. And then what it does is it uses a map and a lambda function to take, because each chunk here, each chunk here has, is this. So it has our header and then the numbers that we want in it, but it uses a lambda function to split off this header part into a tuple. And so the tuple in the first item has, has the header, and in the rest of the item has just, just the number, which is the thing that we're interested in. Then it applies a filter to that, and what the filter does is it rejects everything in the list that doesn't match the stuff one header that I'm trying to pull out. Then what it does after that, it all that's left are these green boxes here that match. And what it does is it goes through and, and maps a function on here that converts these from strings into doubles, because I want to end up with a list of numbers at the end. So it converts these into doubles, and then this thing down here uses a fold just to add these doubles together to end up with a single number here, and here, and here. And so we've seen everything else, all the other things, except for composition now. And so what I can do is instead of binding each of these lines to a variable, and then using this variable here, so here, I probably can't see it, but uh, the, the, the input string is broken into lines and bound on the input lines. Then I use input lines here and call it segments. Then I use segments here and call it header segments. I keep going that way. But what I can do instead is get rid of those variable assignments, and see, since each, each step that I was doing takes one thing, transforms it, and outputs it, and then the next passes it on to the, to the next step. This is a good candidate for doing function composition, because I can take a thing in the beginning and pass it into a function that's like a sort of fusion of all the intermediate steps, which just takes a thing in, does all the transformation, and spits a thing out. So that's what we do here. It, it, uh, it sort of works backwards, because when you use the dot operator, it kind of the, it, it applies things almost kind of in the reverse of the list, the, the way that you would read it. So what it does first is it breaks the file into lines, then uses our segment or prefix function, does the map where it splits it into the uh, tuple, filters the tuples, um, discards the, uh, the uh, header, and then converts the strings into doubles, and adds them together. And that's, that's what it does. So now we've, we've gotten the composition done. Okay, so this is the entire program here. And we have a uh, main function here that reads in the file called inputfile.txt. Reads it into a big string, applies our process2 function with the appropriate um, little prefix and header to detect where the, where the uh, little chunks are. And then it puts that out to the console and ends up printing, printing out something like this. And so 
I forgot to mention that, that, that that's a very, very heavy Haskell example, which should maybe be in the second part of the talk, but it's very relevant for um, going through all of these different functional programming techniques, which is why I, I had it in this part of the talk. So now let's get back to some of the other sort of general features of functional languages. Um, immutability is one. Um, functions in functional programming, you usually try to avoid functions that, that, that change things. You can, you can change, you can take in variables and then alter and then use them and then output something different, but compared to, say, an object-oriented uh, imperative language where you would pass in a class and your function might alter variables inside that class or call functions which would, in that class, cause the variables inside that class to change, which might even contain other classes which would call other class functions which would cause things to change. In imperative programming, especially object-oriented, there's lots of side effects that, that go on where there are, where there's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes that, that, you, that, that you're not necessarily aware of just by the, the lines that you're evaluating. But in functional programming, you try to make your functions not change any data inside of it. Um, another feature is garbage collection, uh, Lisp and Scheme and Closure, Haskell, and all, all, those, other, all those other ones use, use garbage collection. And Closures is another one. Closures essentially allow you to, to uh, take data in to, or you have a function that you specify some, some data in, it then returns a function that sort of encodes that information into your function. Um, an example might be uh, if you have, say, some computation, say you've got a machine uh, learning thing where you want to train a machine learning algorithm and you pass in a bunch of training data or some context data or configuration information. It does some processing in it and then spits out a function that is sort of ready to go with all the information that, that you passed in. And it just takes in one variable or one bit of information, does the processing on all the stuff that you fed it, and then outputs a piece of information. So it's a way of, I guess, um, shielding the user from having to pass in a, a whole bunch of stuff by baking it into a function that already contains all that information in it. And it happens all the time in Haskell. Um, in Erlang, it doesn't happen at all because you can't do it. But in uh, wait, I shouldn't say that. No, you can do it in Erlang. But in in, in Haskell, even partially applying a function creates a closure. And because uh, maybe I won't get into that. But even when you're applying uh, a multivariable function in Haskell, it evaluates the function one variable at a time. And so as it consumes the variables that are further to the, to the right of the function, it's creating closures every time to evaluate them. And so it happens all over the place in, in the Haskell. So things that are absent in function languages are loops. You don't have for loops or while loops or do loops. Um, you don't have multiple assignments. Um, it has to start there because in Scala, Scala lets you Scala kind of lets you do functional programming if you want, but also lets you do imperative programming if you want. There are, I think, the, the var types allow you to mutate variables, but val types don't. If I have that wrong, please feel free to correct me. Um, Object-oriented is absent in some languages, that's why there's a star there. Um, and global variables, you usually don't have global variables because that would imply mutation of, of of data outside of the scope of the functions. Okay, so let's take a look at some contemporary languages and the different features they have. We've got Haskell, OCaml, Scala, Clojure, and Erlang. Um, Haskell is a pure language, and pure means that your functions don't have side effects. Um, it has a big check mark there because Haskell is very strict about that. Um, it is possible, however, for Haskell to make side effects happen because if your language wasn't able to have any side effects, it would be kind of useless. But the, the big difference with Haskell is that the side effects are contained in what's called the IO monad, which I'll get, get to later. Whereas the difference with these other languages is that you can make side effects happen wherever you want, whenever you want. It's up to the programmer to be disciplined enough to not cause side effects within, within functions. Um, 
Haskell, OCaml, and Scala are typed, and Clojure and Erlang are not typed. Um, laziness, uh, it's the difference between lazy evaluation or eager evaluation. Haskell is lazy sort of from the ground up. It's founded, the language is founded on a lazy evaluation scheme. And what that means is that when you evaluate things, it doesn't actually go through and calculate, evaluate the functions until it actually needs to. So if you had a big data structure that you pass into a function and you do a whole bunch of stuff, but you don't actually end up printing it out or using any of that information, none of that actually gets evaluated. But if you print it out at the end, say you print out the, the, um, the number of lines in the big list that you're calculating, well, it doesn't actually have to evaluate the items in the list in order to know how long it is, so it won't do any of the evaluation. It'll just go through and say, well, what's the length of the starting list? It's 10. Well, let's just go through and we'll, we'll see that we actually have to have 10 items here, but we don't need to evaluate what's actually in there. And, but then if you try printing out one of the things that's in the list, then it will actually have to go and evaluate. So um, it delays evaluation as long as possible, which makes it more efficient, but makes it a lot harder to reason about. OCaml has a tilt here because you can define functions that get evaluated lazily. And Scala has a tilt here because you have data structures that employ lazy evaluation. These languages don't, don't use it as a sort of foundation of the language. Closure and Erlang are not lazy. Here's OO object-oriented. Haskell is not object-oriented. Neither is Clojure or Erlang, but OCaml and Scala are. Some people might be concerned about the absence of object-orientedness, but you can solve problems just fine without object-oriented. Um, one of the nice things about functional programming is that it's, um, because of the way that you can break functions down using sort of chunks of, of, of functionality, you often don't, don't need object-oriented techniques, or you can get by just fine without them. In Haskell, you can almost kind of, of emulate classes using data types. Okay, so, should have been about an hour. Oh, only 45 minutes or so. Um, this is probably, Andrew, what do you think? Should we, should we break here? Should I keep going? Yeah. Okay. Let's take a break for 15 minutes and come back. <laughs>